Good morning, Discover Church. It's so good to see you this morning. How's everybody doing today? You doing good? Awesome. For the record, I'm a beach guy. For the record, I'm a beach guy. Uh, pools and lakes are okay, but take me to a beach. Uh, and I'm going to be pretty happy with that. Let me ask you a quick question. Uh, how many of you, if you know this statement, I want you to finish it, uh, if you've heard it before. Birds of a feather flock together. Birds of a feather flock together. You know, that's a true statement. I don't know if you knew that. And it's not just true about birds. It's true about people. Uh, if, you, if you will think back with me to when you were in middle school or high school, I want you to think back to uh, the, 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 the social groups, the people groups, the connections that people made in school. I know for me, I went to five different schools from kindergarten through 12th grade. I went to five different school districts in three different states. All right. Some of the schools are really big and some of the schools are really small. And here's, here's what I learned. I learned that birds of a feather really do flock together because the jocks always found each other. Right? And here's what's true about the jocks. They almost always thought they were better than everybody else. Okay? Uh, the pretty girls, they, they, they always found each other. And, and they always typically had a bit of an attitude to anyone who wasn't a pretty girl or someone who wasn't a jock. All right? Here's the other thing I found. I found that bookworms, they also found each other. You never really heard from them because they were in a corner reading books together, but, but they found each other. Uh, the, the, the computer nerds, I say that affectionately would always find each other and talk, talk nerd speak, stuff that I just never understood, right? Like I, I, sometimes I, I have, as a kid, and then I spent 11 years as a youth pastor, man, I, I hung out with all different kinds of people. But sometimes I really thought that like the computer nerd kids, like if there was a way for them to just speak binary to each other, I think that they would do it. Right, but as a youth pastor, some of those kids, the bookworms and the and the computer nerds, um, they, you know, they would they kind of have a hard time with things. And I would tell them as a youth pastor, I said, "Listen, I know that things are hard now, but in 15 years, all those kids that are giving you a hard time are going to work for you. <laughs> so, trust me, your day is coming. Just just stick with it now." Th- I went to five different schools in three different states. The largest chunk of time I spent at a small school in, in Arkansas called Brooklyn, the Brooklyn School District. We had 80 kids in my graduating class, okay? So because of that, we, we didn't have all of like the, the spinoffs and all of the, you know, the extra categories. We just had really two categories that every kid fit into one or the other. There were the haves and the have-nots. There was the cool kids and everybody else. And you qualified to be a cool kid if you made a sports team or a cheer team. Or if you were going out with somebody who was on one of those two teams, right? Like, so if you were part of that, you were, you were, you were a have, you were, you were a cool kid. If you didn't, you were kind of in the other crowd. Okay. Now for me, my, my freshman year or my eighth grade year of high school, um, I, I had the, we had the requirement, the last part to make the basketball team. We'd gone through all the skills stuff, right? And, and the coach was weeding the last people out. We had to run two miles in less than 20 minutes. I came in at 19 minutes and 57 seconds. Crushed it. <laughs> right? And so listen, I, I, I knew my role, right? Like I, 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 was, I was firmly placed at the bottom of the cool kid's slot. And I was okay with that because it meant I wasn't in the other crowd, okay? Nothing against the other crowd, but at that stage of life, you know, when you're 13, 14 years old, you're just like, you know, it's either, either you know, you're, you're, a, you're a prey or you're a predator. And I was just trying to like not be a prey really was my aim. And so because I was kind of at the bottom end of the cool crowd, um, it meant that I was kind of the butt of everybody's jokes. And I was okay with that. Uh, I really was. I was, I was pretty thick skinned. I had a pretty quick wit. After 12 years of marriage, I've learned and been told several times that I'm an emotional black hole. And so I just, you know, like some of those things just didn't really bother me the way that maybe it would have other kids. And so y'all pray for my wife because, you know, I just, sometimes just don't feel things. But I'm learning and I'm trying to, you know, feel my feelings and, 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 and that kind of thing. I'm trying. Y'all pray for me as I work through that. But here's, here's the reason why I'm bringing all this up. I don't know if you know this or not, but the same way that we, that we classify people in middle school and high school, we, we do the same thing as adults. We just do it differently. So whereas it used to be whether or not you made, you know, you got a varsity letter, you got a letterman's jacket, or you, you, know, you read a lot, or you were into 
computer stuff or, 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 or maybe you were, you know, you were in, in, in acting or music or theater or band or whatever. We don't really classify or categorize people like that anymore. Instead, we, we categorize people based off race. We categorize people based off of political persuasion. We categorize people based off of their relationship status. We categorize people based off of the appearance of their, their, their financial well-being. And, and it's, it's not necessarily that, that, that it's, it, it's bad that that happens, um, but, it's, but it's, we have to have an understanding that it happens. And, and, and there's a, that what happens is, is, is in the church, if we're not careful, it can lead us to the blind spot that the Bible is going to address today. Now, we were in this series called Blind Spots where we're looking through the book of James verse by verse this summer, and God is taking us and using James, who, who under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit wrote this letter and has drawing our gaze and our attention to these areas that we either didn't know exist or are areas that, that we know that exist, but we don't really think it's that big of a deal. We're not willing to be honest that it's really a problem. And God is drawing our attention to these areas. And the blind spot that God is going to be drawing our attention to today is on the area or the issue of showing partiality. Or, to put it another way, showing favoritism. All right? And so that's where God's going to take us today. And I believe that God has some very practical things to share with us from his word about how this area affects our lives. And that that all of us are probably, in one way or another, guilty of doing this. All right, so if, we're, if you're with me, I want you to pick up your Bibles. We're going to be in James chapter 2 in a, t- in a message that I've called, I've titled, blah, the message that I have titled, Don't Hold Back. Because what we're going to see at the end of the message is that the, the cure for showing partiality is there's some things that we need to not hold back from. And so if you've got your Bibles, we're in James chapter 2, verse 1. If you're with me, let me hear you say blind spots. Blind spots. Come on, here we go. James chapter 2, verse 1. It says this, my brethren... Do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Now, now what, what, is he, what is he saying here? Well, he's, he's saying, listen, you, you, you need to not hold the faith of our Lord in partiality. What does that mean? Well, when he's talking about the faith of our Lord, he's talking about the gospel. He's talking about the good news of Jesus. He's talking about the truth that, that, that we are all, all messed up and jacked up in some kind of way because of sin. And Jesus, instead of coming to condemn us and, and to punish us immediately for our sin, instead he did the opposite. He came to become sin for us, 2 Corinthians 5 says, so that we might know the righteousness on his behalf. Meaning that Jesus Jesus came and exchanged his righteousness for our wretchedness so that we can experience something new. Or to look at it differently, that Jesus came and when he took on our sins, he made it so that when God looks at us, he would treat us like he would have treated Jesus because he treated Jesus like we deserve to be treated. And because of that, we can have a new life. Because of that, we can have hope. Because of that, we can have peace. Because of that, our past doesn't have to define us. Because of that, we don't have to be known by the worst thing that we ever did. We could be known by the greatest thing that ever happened when we gave our life to Christ and he he made us new and, and, and cleaned us up and picked us up and set us on a new course heading. And so that's what this this faith of our Lord is talking about. And so James is saying, listen, y'all need to not hold that truth away from people by showing partiality. Now, most of us would say, and I believe this is true about you because it's true about me, that most of us would would never say, there's nobody that I hate enough that I would rather they spend an eternity in hell than have the opportunity to experience the life change that I've experienced. Most of us don't know somebody that we hate enough to do that. And so because of that, most of us wouldn't say, you know, if we were to have a conversation with Jesus when we get to heaven and Jesus go, hey, what's up with them? Were they not good enough for you that, 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 that you wanted them to know about me? But instead what happens, and, and again, this, this is true for me and perhaps maybe it's true for you, that, that, that as a follower of Jesus, we know that, that part of the, 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 the process of being a follower of Jesus is telling people about the ways that Jesus has changed our lives. And that shouldn't be a a need to, it shouldn't be a supposed to, it shouldn't be an ought to, it should be a get to. We get to tell people 
I mean, listen, we tell people about the, a good cup of coffee. We tell people about a good movie. We tell people about a good restaurant. We tell people about a good vacation. A vacation. Surely we can tell people about a good Savior. But what happens is, is at least for me, is that sometimes I'm in situations and, and, I, and I see, right, like we're, we're, we're tracking this direction and I see the off-ramp, you know, to veer off of from physical conversation and to get over here to start talking about spiritual things. And maybe this is just true about me, but maybe it's true about you too, that, that, that sometimes I just kind of can tr- keep on trucking, you know, like, whoop, there it went. Oops, missed my turn. Right, and the Holy Spirit comes in like Siri does, like recalculating, recalculating. (laughs) Right, so so most of us don't withhold the gospel from people because we hate them. Most of the times we do it because we just kind of miss it. Or, or we didn't have the faith in the moment. But there's another way that that becomes a blind spot that if you don't know about it, then you could end up being in a situation where God says something about you that you didn't even know was true because you didn't even know that you had missed it. And that it is, par- is, is the way that we show partiality. Now James is going to paint for us a hypothetical situation. Let's look at this in verse 2. It says this, For if there should come into your assembly, and I want to pause right there. Here's the immediate context of what James is getting ready to tell. He's talking about the assembly, meaning he's talking about the gathering of the church, meaning he's talking about like what we're doing right now. Okay, so if there should come into your church a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man with filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, go, hey, 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 you look important. You look like, are you famous? Are you rich? I don't know, but you look like you're somebody that I want to spend some time with because you seem to have something that I don't have. Or I too am rich and famous. I only like to spend time with rich and famous people. Okay, that's what he's saying. So if someone with fine clothes comes in, say, you sit here in a good place. And then you say to the poor man, who the heck is that? We don't want that kind in our church. You go sit over there. Or or let me make you my footstool, meaning, meaning let me make you my servant. He says, have you not shown partiality amongst yourselves and become judges? with evil thoughts. What is he doing? Well, he's, he's talking about something that is kind of a natural thing for us to do, that, that we're naturally kind of drawn to certain types of people. And for most of us, we naturally seem to ignore other types of people. And what he's revealing is this incredible blind spot of understanding that at the root of that is something that's not okay. He's saying if, you, if someone walks in the doors of your church and you immediately are, are partial to them and show favoritism and go, hey, won't you come sit with me? Let me take you to the best seat in the house. While at the same time noticing someone who, who doesn't fit in that category and you ignore them or, 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 or you act like they don't even exist or even worse, you treat them like they are a second class citizen. Then what James is saying is that you are showing partiality. Now, now, any of us who know the definition of partiality, that's not the big aha moment here. That's not the light bulb moment. Here's the light bulb moment. When James follows that and says, and you yourselves have become judges with evil thoughts. Let me translate that. If and when you behave that way, then you are practicing evil. Now, I don't know about you, but that like, a little bit of a gut punch. Now, here's what I, so far, I I believe is true about us, that I don't necessarily think this is a problem in our church. I would like to believe it's not. I haven't heard that it is. Matter of fact, I hear the opposite. One of the things that I hear regularly when people come to our church, they go, oh, I love your church. I'm the guy that doesn't just go, oh, thank you so much. I'm the guy that like takes it a step further. I'm like, well, Why? And I I, like immediately I'm kind of like met with this look of like, what do you mean why? I don't know. I didn't didn't really think about it. Just in general, it was a good experience. I really liked it. And, you know, gosh, just be thankful. I said I liked your church, okay? (laughs) The same thing when someone says, hey, that was a really good sermon. Some of you have asked me this and you've experienced me respond, oh, man, praise God. What resonated with you? What? Well, I don't know. I didn't know you were going to ask that question. 
It was just really good. Why? It just was, okay? What do you want me to say? It was bad? Well, if you tell me it's bad, you know what I'm going to ask? Well, what did you not like about it? <laughs> right? Like, I don't know. I just like to know, like, what's going on beneath the surface. But here's the deal. I have heard so many say, man, your church is, is so friendly. It's so warm. It feels like such a, such a welcoming environment. And here's what's crazy about it. People think they're paying me a compliment, but they're not. What they're really doing is just bragging on you. And so you make your, your pastor's heart very happy and very proud. So I just want to say thank you to all of you. You can give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you for being a place where people can walk in the door and feel loved and accepted. Okay. So I don't, I don't think that this is necessarily an issue specifically in our church. And so what I want to do, what I felt like God was leading me to do was, hey, take this, take this that extra step, right? Like, your church is good. Why? Right? So I'm going to take it that extra step. And I want, to, I want to take this and connect it to a slightly more general application, not just specific to what we do when we're here at church on Sunday mornings. But I want to apply it a little bit more generally to the way that we behave when we're not at church. Mm-hmm. I'm going to get in your Kool-Aid a little bit today. Because here's what I believe. As followers of Jesus, it's our responsibility to represent him well. And if we have this blind spot we're not aware of, then we could be potentially unawaringly, unawaringly? I just made that up. (laughs) Representing Christ poorly. And that's no bueno. So I want to dive into this today. Now, I told you at the beginning that, 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 that there's something in our nature that is drawn to this, right? And there's, there's something about it that's not, not completely wrong. There's something about it in our nature that we're just drawn to certain things. But I want to ask the question, why is it in any scenario, why is it that there are certain situations where we are drawn to be partial to, other, to certain people, excuse me, while ignoring other people? Well, I believe that there's a few things, and, and, and these are things that, that, that are at least true about me, about why I do this. The first is that I believe it helps us to feel better about our own brokenness, about our own poverty, and about the reality that we are a have-not. Meaning that, that what I know about all of us is that we at, 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 there's a part of us that we are all hurting and broken people. Even, even being an emotional black hole, I can acknowledge that there are certain parts of my life, certain parts of my soul that, that I don't really like going to and I don't really like talking about because there's a brokenness there, there's a hurt there that hasn't been fully dealt with. Perhaps if I was a little bit more aware of my emotions, I could deal with them a little bit better, but I'm working on that. And so at the root of it, we're, we're all We're all broken. We're all hurting in some way. And so when we have a moment to to be in the presence of someone who doesn't appear to be broken, someone who doesn't appear to be hurting, someone who doesn't appear to be in poverty, someone who doesn't appear to be less than, it somehow lifts our spirits. And here's what I've learned to be true. I've, I've learned that, that I've yet to meet somebody who would say, man, I have, I have accomplished everything that there is to accomplish. I have everything that I've ever wanted. I can never want for anything more. And if I do have that conversation with somebody, I'll normally follow with, well, so what's next? And then they'll begin to tell me, well, next I want to, blah, 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 blah. thus negating everything that they just told me about how they've, they've arrived and they've gotten everything that they wanted. And so we're all in this process because there's a brokenness and because there's a hurt. Because, because of that brokenness and hurt, we feel like there's something inside of us that is wanting. And, and so we strive for more and we look for more in all these places and we dig these wells looking for, for more satisfaction, more contentment, more peace, more, more security, more safety, more acceptance. And it's rooted in the fact that we're all broken and we're all hurting. And so when we get to be in the presence of someone who doesn't appear to be like I am, but it appears to be a little bit better, somehow just being in the presence of that lifts my spirits up. The second reason why I think that we show partiality is because even even in the smallest of run-ins with the rich and the famous, 
the beautiful and the powerful. That, that chance encounter where, their, where our life intersects with theirs, somehow that sticks with us and somehow it makes us feel like we're more valuable. Let me ask this question. How many of you ever had a run-in, an encounter, or something like that with somebody that would be generally perceived as rich or famous, powerful or beautiful? Anybody? Raise your hands, raise your hands, raise your hands, raise your hands. All right, cool. Here's what, I, here's what I know to be true. If you and I were to start having conversations about that, we would start measuring our story based on whether or not the person I met is more beautiful, more powerful, more rich, or more famous than the person that you met. The reason why I know that is because if I were to tell you my story, you would immediately respond with your story, right? It's not necessarily a wrong thing. It's just human nature. Well, I, you know, like for instance, when I was a kid, I was in high school. I had an opportunity to meet Phil Mickelson. Now, if you're not a golfer, like that means nothing to you, okay? But there was a day when, when, when there was Tiger Woods. Everybody's heard of Tiger Woods, I think, unless you've been living under a rock, right? Everyone knows, has heard of Tiger Woods and Phil Mickelson, man, like they were like, butting heads for who's the best golfer in the world. And Tiger always, almost always beat Phil. And I had an opportunity when I was a kid for like a brief moment, I saw Phil, I was at a golf tournament and I was watching Phil and I was, I was like standing next to the ropes that they use to protect the golfers from the crazy people like me. And, and I had my, my fist out like this, like, what's up, Phil? Good job, Phil. You can do it, Phil. Give me fist bump, Phil. And like for, for three eighths of a second, like his four knuckles and my four knuckles touched. Well, he was wearing a golf glove. So like, you know, right. And somebody thought that was funny. <laughs> right. And, and, and like, so for a moment, like our knuckles touched. And from that moment, I was like, you know, Phil Mickelson's a cool dude. I think me and Phil could be friends. <laughs> Phil and I could play golf together. He'd beat me, but you know, it'd be fun. He feels me a cool guy to hang out with. Me and Phil are friends, actually. Right? Like, like that, that's just kind of what we do. And so, so here's what's crazy, though. You and me telling our stories of encountering the rich and the famous and the powerful and the beautiful and the influential meant something to you. It meant something to me. Because for a brief moment kind of made me feel like I knew somebody. And everybody that I talked to who cares anything about golf that had never met Phil Mickelson, I felt like I was a little bit better than them because, well, me and Phil, we're bros. But here's what I know is true. I was 14 years old when that happened. That was almost 20 years ago. Good night, I'm getting old. That was almost 20. Some of you are going, shut up. Right, that was almost 20 years ago. And I still remember, I remember where I was. I remember what I was wearing. I remember who I was with. I remember what I was doing. I remember why I was there. Can I tell you something? Phil Mickelson doesn't remember any of it because it meant nothing to him. But for me, I'm a nobody. He's a somebody. And that brief moment where our lives intersected meant something to me. And I carry it as a badge of honor when I have conversations with people like, oh yeah, I met Phil Mickelson, top that. The only way you can beat me is if you met Tiger Woods. And Tiger Woods was a jerk for like 20 years and so pretty sure you didn't meet him. There's something about it that causes me to have, feel like I have more intrinsic value and more worth. The third thing, at least for me, is that sometimes if you're in the have category, we have this tendency to only want to spend time with people who we perceive are also in the have category. And that what can accompany that is, is a little bit of pride and arrogance that says, well, you know, I mean, we're, we're so much better than they are. I have this and this and this, and this person has this and this and this, and so, so I want to only hang out with the haves, and I'm not going to worry myself with those people. Can I tell you something? A lot of us go, well, I, I'm not a have, so I don't have to worry about that. Can I tell you? You're, a ha you're in the have category to somebody. I was in Peru a few weeks ago, blew me away. Five-year-old kids that can't speak a lick of English waving American flags as we we're coming off the bus. It made me feel uncomfortable, honestly. I talked to one of the other pastors there who had been on several of these trips, and I was like, man, I just feel awkward, you know, like, 
Like, I feel like they're treating me like a celebrity, and I'm like, trust me, I ain't. He said, yeah, but to, you, to them that you are. You came from America. Somebody in America is the one who paid for them to have this church. Somebody in America sponsored that kid so that they can have food and they can have education and they can eat. You're from America. You represent that. You're in the have category, buddy. Made me feel uncomfortable. Like, I, honestly, like I wanted to be like, well, my, the guy I was talking to was like shaking hands with every little kid and all that stuff. And I was like, man, it just makes me feel, feel uncomfortable. He said, get over it. You never know how much you'll impact a little girl's life when you bend over and go, oh, muy bonita. You see, we're all a have to somebody. But we have to be careful in the midst of being a have that we don't become prideful and we don't become arrogant. You see, here's what I want to do. I want to be careful that, what, that you don't hear what I'm not saying. Okay, there is, there is a truth to the idea that birds of a feather flock together that is true, that isn't inherently wrong. It, it matters how we choose to uh, uh, carry that out. It matters how we choose to live with that. And so what I want to do is I want to draw a line of separation that separates partiality from friendship. Because God is not attacking our desire for relationship. God is not attacking our desire for community. God is not attacking our desire for friendship. What he is attacking is our, our tendency, our blind spot, if we're not careful, to go from friendship to partiality. So I want to I paint a couple things to help bring some clarity. Because partiality ultimately says, I'm better than you. Friendship says, well, I'm not better than you, but I do have a better connection with them than I have with you. To say or believe or behave that I'm better than you is wrong. But to just acknowledge I'm not better than you, but I just got better connections over here, that's not wrong. Let me, let me give you a second one. Partiality focuses on difference. Oh, we're so different. We have nothing in common. How can you ever, how can me and you ever be in a, in a relationship or connection together? How could we ever have, find common ground? But friendship simply acknowledges those differences and focuses on the desire. Yeah, we may have a lot of differences, but we're on the same planet. We're breathing the same oxygen. We're facing a lot of the same issues. And if you're in Christ, we have the same Jesus with the same hope. And so we may have a lot of things that we differ about, but man, there's a lot of things we can connect on. And I need some people because I can't do life alone and I need some people to do life with. The third, the third thing says this. Partiality is rooted in pride. Partiality says, I'm just too good, better. I don't need you. I only need a select group of people that fit a very select group of categories of, that, that fits you know, me because I'm so good. But friendship is simply rooted in community. I need people. And so listen, we, we're doing small groups. We're trying to let you know about small groups. Here's the deal. What, why we do the groups that we do? Because we want to help you get connected with people you can find some common ground with. Hey, listen, I... I'm going to be leading a golf small group. If you don't like playing golf, you don't have to come to my small group. If you like playing golf, man, go to the website. Check it out. If we can have you be a part of it, come on. We can have some fun together playing golf. And here's the deal. I promise you won't cuss on the golf course because the preacher man's with you. So you're going to be good. You can go home after playing golf and not feel bad about it. Birds of a feather do flock together. So listen, find, find people who share a common interest. That's okay. Just don't start thinking that you're better than somebody because your interests are different than theirs. Because your story is different from theirs. Because your background is different from theirs. Because listen to me, apart from Jesus, there's no hierarchy. There is a have and a have not. The haves who have experienced the life-changing power of the gospel of Jesus Christ and those who have not. And can I tell you something? All of us are equal and on the same playing ground at the foot of the cross of Jesus. Amen. So what, what else does James have, James has for us? I want you to notice he continues in verse 5. He says, listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? Now, God is bursting through with this sobering reality that, that it's, it's hard for rich folk to have great faith. 
And that it's the poor folk that God has chosen to, to, to make rich in matters of faith. Why? Well, two reasons. There's both the, 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 the practical, physical application of financial wealth that, that someone who has little, the concept of I surrender all doesn't seem very big. But to somebody who has much, the concept of I surrender all seems crazy. But the call of Jesus is the same. He says, I want it all, whether it's big or small. But there's also a spiritual component to it that God is saying, listen, it's those who have chosen to be poor in the things of this world, not necessarily just in the financial sense, but poor in the sense that I don't put a lot of stock in the things of the world because I've put all of my stock in the things of heaven. And so for those who have, have put all of their stock in the things of this world, they are going to be very poor when it comes to heaven. But for those who have, who have invested their things into the things of heaven, into the ways of heaven, into eternity, they are going to be made rich. Why? Because they recognize that nothing in this world gets to last and stay. It's all going to go away. And so they've chosen to be poor in the eyes of, of what I invest in and what I make a big deal and what I pursue when it comes to the things of the earth. But I've chosen to invest as much as possible into the things of heaven. And scripture says, the poor of this world will be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised. Verse six, but you dishonor the poor man. How, how do we dishonor the poor man? When we show partiality, when we ignore him, when we refuse him, when we treat him or her like they are less than, we dishonor them. And do not the rich oppress you and drag you into courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? What is he saying? He's saying, listen, you guys have this tendency to elevate people of position and wealth and fame and, and, and notoriety and all that stuff. But have you ever stopped to think that, that those same people are the ones who are in position to do something about the oppression that you're facing? Remember the context. James is writing this letter to a bunch of people who had chosen to follow Christ, stepped away from the Old Testament uh, Jewish way of doing things, and they had been oppressed and chased out of their homes, either by the Jewish leaders or by the Roman government. And so he's saying, listen, you guys elevate them to this position, but they're the ones who were in positions to do something about the oppression that you face, yet they ain't doing squat. So why do you elevate them? Why do you clamor to be near them? Why do you, why do you clamor when they walk in the room? Why are you excited and, and, and oh my gosh, that person walked in the room. I got to go over here close to them. Like, oh my gosh, da, 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 why, why, do we, why do you do that? Because if we understood the ways of God and the kingdom of God, we would understand that we should actually do the opposite, that we should clamor and strive and crawl and, and, and claw to be in the presence of those who are less than. Because that's what Jesus did. Luke chapter 4, verse 18 puts it this way. The Spirit of the Lord, this is Jesus speaking. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery sight of the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Listen, I don't know if you realize it or not, but before Jesus, if you know Jesus, before you met him, that was you. You were the blind to see the truth. You were oppressed by your sin. You were captive to what they said about you. But because of Jesus came and chose to spend time with the less than, that was me and that was you, our story can be different. Our story can be changed. And if we really understood the kingdom of God, if we really understood the ways of God and the ways of the word of God, then we wouldn't, we wouldn't strive and go out of the way to, to, to just be in the presence of, of, of famous and rich people. But we would go out of our way to try to be in the presence of those who are perceived as less than. Listen, it's not wrong to buy your VIP meet and greet passes. It's not wrong to go to that place where that famous person is going to be. It's not wrong to go hear that speaker. To go to None of those things are wrong. He's not saying that. I'm not saying that. But what we're getting at, what God is speaking to us about is the heart of the issue, that the gospel is at stake. Are we ignoring people who were considered less than so that we can appease something that only Christ can satisfy internally by going and spending time with people who were considered as more than. 
And don't forget that, that you might be perceived as somebody who is more than now, as someone who is in the have category now, but before you met Christ, you were a have not. And thankfully, Jesus didn't come to this earth to, to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He said, greater love has no man than this, and he who would lay his life down for his friends. He came to be with the have-nots because he had something significant to give them. Now, he's going to get in verse 8 to 12. He's going to make this interesting theological jump here. And I want you to track with me and follow with me for a second. He says, if you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. Congratulations. Good job. High five. Gold star. <laughs> but if you show partiality, you commit sin. Ooh. And are convicted by the law as transgressors, meaning someone who's done something wrong. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point is guilty of all. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. Now if you do not commit adultery but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. What is he saying? He's saying, listen, you had adultery. Bad. But you didn't kill somebody. Good. According to the law, still bad. He's saying you, 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 can, you, can show partial, you can show partiality but never commit adultery and never commit murder. And according to the law, according to the truth of God's word, you are guilty of all of it. But then he says, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. What is he doing here? He's contrasting two laws. The Old Testament law, the old law that the Jews had known, the people who he was writing to, that's all they had ever known. And he is contrasting that with this new law. He calls it the royal law. He calls it the law of liberty. And he said, listen, you need to understand that there is a new law in place now. Now, what was true about the old law is true of the new law, that if you stumble or sin or struggle in any one area, you're guilty of it all. But here's the difference. There is a significant difference between what, what's going on with the old law and what's going on with the new. Because in the Old Testament system, anything that you were guilty of, you were guilty of all, and good luck trying to figure that out. What is he talking about? What is this new law? He gives us a clue in verse 8. If you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love the neighbor as yourself. You do well. What is he talking about here? He's talking about the great commandment that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 22 when he was asked. I talked about this a moment last week. He was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He said, this is the great commandment, that if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and you love your neighbor as yourself, on these two things hang all of the law of the prophets, meaning all of the old law sits on these two things. He simplified the whole process. The old law was, was super rigid and complicated and difficult and had so many nuances. And Jesus comes in and says, listen, let me simplify the whole thing for you. You want to fulfill the law of God? Love him and love people as yourself. What does that mean? It means that the old law said that we were duty bound to obey God and follow the rules. And if we did not obey God and follow the rules... But the new law says that we are bound to love God and love others. Sweet, I don't have to obey the rules anymore. No. It looks like Jesus just made things a lot simpler, but he actually just made things a lot harder. Because in the old law, there was all kinds of rules written about what you're supposed to do and what situation and what scenario, so on and so forth. But the new law, Jesus says, listen, there's just a lot of things. Let's just call it what it is. There's a lot of things. I didn't tell you what was right and wrong. So I'm going to simplify it. In any situation where you can't go back to the word and it clearly say this is right and this is wrong, then you just filter it through this filter. How can I in this moment show that I love God above all else and love people as myself? Let me frame it for you in a slightly different way. The old law bound you to expectations and regulations on how you're supposed to treat people differently. 
In the Old Testament law, there were, there were rules that the Pharisees had built in that, that if somebody was sick with, with a contagious illness, right, that, that, that they, had to, had, they had to be downwind of the Pharisees. And it sounds really good. It sounds like, well, we don't want the holy men, the men of God, to get sick with this contagious illness because if they all get sick, who's going to do God's bidding and who's going to do all the, the spiritual stuff? But in reality, what it was about, it was, it was about keeping the poor people away from the position people. Because if you became sick with one of those illnesses, you couldn't work and you were poor. And the Pharisees didn't want to, didn't want to get their hands dirty with the people who had real needs. It's part of the reason why they couldn't understand Jesus when he came and spent time with people who were sick, spent time with people who were ill, spent time with people who were cast out. They didn't understand that. The old law bound you to expectations and relation, regulations on how to treat people differently, but the new law releases you from those expectations and releases you from all those regulations to go, well, what am I supposed to do in this situation? And what does it say? And how do I do this? And in this situation, you turn left, take three steps, turn right, extend a right hand and say, hi, how are you? No, 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 no. The, the, the new law releases you from all of the red tape so that you can love and treat people equally. See, the Pharisees just couldn't get this. There's this really interesting story in Mark chapter 3, and you don't have these verses. Mark chapter 3, it's the Sabbath day, and according to the law, the old law, it said that you can't work on the Sabbath. And if you did work on the Sabbath, you were in for some big trouble. And so in Mark chapter 3, uh, Jesus is walking into the temple on the Sabbath, and he sees a man who is crippled. He has a shriveled up hand. And it says this, and Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save or to kill? But they remained silent. He's speaking at the Pharisees. He looked around them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians that they might kill Jesus. They just couldn't understand it. He just broke the old law. What? Hey, hey, whoa, you, you cannot do that. That's against the law. Jesus isn't getting rid of the law. He's saying, come now. It was never about creating regulations on how you're supposed to treat people. But if you were confused by that, I'm bringing a new law that says, love God and love people as yourself. And what that means is, that in any situation, in any scenario, whether in the church or out of the church, that we treat somebody differently than what we would want to be treated, we are guilty of sin and we have become evil in our thoughts. Well, that's not me. I would never do that. Do you treat people of a different race differently? Do you treat people who think differently than you, are, than you do on the abortion issue, on the, on the LGBTQ issue? Do you treat people in the, the liberal or conservative camp differently based on where you are in the spectrum? Do you treat people differently who have different financial means than you do, people who are in a different relationship status than you do? Do you treat people who have something that's in their past that's not a part of your past that you've been forgiven of, but it's in their past, never mind the fact that Christ has forgiven them, do you still look at them with condemnation for what they did back then? You see, we're showing partiality. And in so doing, especially when we do it with people who do not have a relationship with Christ, the scriptures say that we are withholding the faith of Christ from them by our actions. Woo. See, I know I'm preaching good when it gets quiet. I even talked about how y'all behave on social media. James finishes this with this interesting verse, verse 13, for judgment is without mercy for the one who shows no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What does this mean? It means that the law of liberty frees us from bondage and judgment and punishment from sin. Therefore, 
we can now approach people judging them from the perspective of the law of liberty, meaning we do not look at them in condemnation and how dare you and how could you, you're a terrible person, an awful person. We look at them from the perspective that God looked at us when he was moved with compassion to send his son to die for our sins so that he did not have to condemn us in our sin, but he could receive us and welcome us into a relationship with him. That we can view people through the law of liberty instead of the old law, which we would look through with condemnation and how dare you, what's the matter with you? You're a terrible person. You see, this is the reason why we do church the way that we do. That we want everybody in the North, and we want everybody in Kansas City to know, listen, you don't have to believe like us and you don't have to behave like us to be welcomed with us. Because Jesus did not require me to believe like him and behave like him before he chose to come down and spend some time with me so that I could belong with him. I don't care what you look like. I don't care where you came from. I don't care what your story is. I don't care what you think politically. I don't care what you think about issues. What I care most about is your soul. And as followers of Jesus, that has to be the main issue. And when we create lines of division and start showing partiality on other things, then we are withholding the gospel. Doesn't mean that we don't speak on those things. No, that's not what it means. Two weeks ago, I did an entire message on abortion. We have to walk into those waters. But listen to me. We have to be careful that the way that we present ourselves, that we do not become the reason why somebody can't experience the love of Christ. Does God have something to say about your decisions? Yes, he does. Does he have something to say about your political persuasion? Yes, he does. Do he have something to say about who you choose to love and be with and when you choose to love and be with him? Yes, he does. But what he first wants you to hear is that he loves you. He cares about you. He cares about your soul and he gave his life for it. And so how do we apply this and how do we make these connections? I've got two thoughts for you and then we'll be done. The first thing that we have to do when it comes to making sure that we don't become guilty of this blind spot of showing partiality is we have to open our hearts, y'all. So many Christians that I meet fall guilty of this thing. And I'm one of them. I struggle. There's certain areas in my life. If you can know my thoughts, listen, I am jacked up and I have some wicked thoughts in my mind and I need the grace of Jesus on a regular basis. But listen, so many of us have this tendency that we open our heart to the gospel of Jesus, but then we close our heart to people. That can't be true of us. It shouldn't be true of us. Because when we do that, we're showing partiality. And when we show partiality to anyone that doesn't belong with us or anyone doesn't believe with us or behave like us, then what we're conveying is that the message of Jesus is exclusive to the chosen few. You've got to know the secret handshake and you've got to have the VIP card to be able to come in and hang out with us. But that's the opposite of the gospel. A gospel mindset has our heart opened to people and says, no, 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 no. The message of Jesus is not exclusive. It's inclusive. And it's available for everybody. You need hope? Let me take you to somebody who's got some. You need healing? I know a healer. You need peace? Man, I know the creator of peace. You need joy? I know somebody who passes it out in abundance. You need wisdom? He says, I'll give it out to anybody who asks for it. His name is Jesus. And we can't just open our hearts. We, we've got to take it a step further, and we've got to open our hands. Here's what I'm convinced of. I'm convinced that a spirit of hospitality is both the prevention and the cure for partiality that is in your heart and mine. It is really hard to have a closed heart to people when your hands are open to serve them, to help them create a better environment where they can experience Christ and know Christ 
Hey, you know what that means? I'm so thankful for all of our folks serving on our hospitality team, but you know what that means for you? It means that it is the mandate that a follower of Jesus, that if you choose to belong to Discover Church, or if you leave our church and go somewhere else, your mandate as a follower of Jesus in the house of God is hospitality. It means that you look for ways to create an, an enjoyable environment. You pick up trash when you see it. You, 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 you open and close doors when you see it. When stuff's not right, you clean it, you fix it, you put it, you put it where it's supposed to go. And not only that, but you look to build relationships. You create a warm environment. Hey, listen, you may not be officially on the hospitality dream team, but if you are a part of Discover Church, congratulations, you're on the hospitality team. Why do we give you an opportunity? Now, listen, I know it. Statistics say 70% of us are highly, related, highly uh, relatable introverts, right? So when we tell people stand up, shake hands, and it makes y'all uncomfortable, do you know why I do that? I've gotten some feedback on that. It makes me feel uncomfortable. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm sensitive to your uncomfortability, but what I'm not sensitive to is that there's people in the room that are dying and going to hell, that are looking for hope and encouragement. They've walked in the room and nobody's talked to them, and they're going to walk out of here and go, well, if that place, the place that proclaims hope and Jesus and peace and life, if I can't be met with love and grace and acceptance there, then there's nowhere for me. And so I know it's uncomfortable, I know it's awkward, but boy, it's a small thing to do to let somebody know, hey, I don't know you, I don't know your story, I don't know what you got, I don't know what that monkey looks like that's on your back, but I know it's there. But boy, can I just tell you, I'm glad you're in the house of the Lord today, and I'm on the hospitality team because I'm a part of this church, and I'm going to stick my hand out and say, hey, how you doing? My name's Jernigan, and I'm a beach guy. How about you? We've got to open our hearts, we've got to open our hands. And when we do, and as we do, then we begin to understand that we can't hold back our hearts and we can't hold back our hands so that people can know the love of Christ and they can experience his goodness. And maybe, just maybe, because you opened your heart and you opened your hands, they can move from the have-not of not experiencing the life-changing power of the gospel to moving to the have category of being a new creation in Christ, which, by the way, was once you. So if you're here today and you've never experienced the life-changing power of Jesus, if you're here today and you're like, man, my, okay, hope, peace, joy, what's that? It's not my story. Listen to me. It can be your story. But it's only found through Jesus. He said that he is the way and the truth and the life. And if you want to get to God, if you want to go to heaven, if you want what God has, you got to go through him. And salvation has come today for those who don't know him and who have not experienced that in their life. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me?